Pitch three. Lending. From the nasty loan shark to the friendly neighborhood credit union, people have always needed money. And other people have made money by lending it. Fun fact, the earliest recorded seed loan was literally seeds given to farmers. These days, you can usually find someone willing to write you a check, unless you happen to be a manufacturing company in Mexico. That's where today's founder, Luis, comes in with his startup, CredFeed. He wants to solve cash flow issues for SMBs in Mexico. But lending isn't really the kind of thing VCs get excited about. It's also highly competitive. Will Luis be able to convince investors that he can mint a Mexican unicorn? Or is this investment subprime? I'm Josh Muccio, welcome to The Pitch, where real founders pitch real investors for real money, with interest. Let's meet the investors. Elizabeth Yin with Hustle Fund. Do you love the problem you're working on? Charles Hudson with Precursor Ventures. I wish that had been your open. That was so good. Pascal Unger with Focal VC. That's, I think, how you have a chance outside of raising just a boatload of money. Beck Bamberger with Bad Ideas Group. I got to start my muffin business. And Matt Conwell with Rare Breed Ventures. As a unicorn hunter, I want to see every unicorn. The pitch for CredFeed is coming up after the break. And if you're not following the show already, hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. You can find the uncut version of this pitch at patreon.com slash the pitch. Before we get started, there's a type of lending called factoring, where instead of a house or another physical asset, you can use an invoice as collateral. So if you need money now, you don't have to wait around for customers to pay. All you need is proof that someone is going to pay you. That's factoring. Got it? Okay. Enter Luis. I, I don't go to any more demo days. I, I like that. I'll speak at your accelerator. I don't want to come to demo day. Hey. How's it going? Well, good, Mike. How are you? How are you? Nice to see you, man. Hey. Hey, Charles. Charles. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, man. Good to see you. Good to see you, Lisette. Hey. Let's go. Hey, nice to meet you, Pascal. Hey, Beck. Nice, nice to, meet to meet you, you Beck. So, I'm Luis, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of CredFeed. And at CredFeed, we have already unlocked over $13.5 million from the cash flows of small and mid-sized businesses. Did you know that 70% of all SMBs in Mexico are actually profitable when they go bankrupt? Hmm. I saw this happen firsthand at the last startup that I was a part of. And the reason is because B2B companies have to wait up to six months to get paid by their customers. Mm -hmm. And 80% of all SMEs in Mexico still do not have access to any kind of credit products, making cash flow issues and the lack of access to financing the reasons why these companies are going out of business. So at CredFit, we built a platform that enables these companies to unlock their cash flow by turning their receivables into instant cash, mm -hmm. allowing them to grow and to prevent cash crunches. Mm -hmm. So while doing Techstars, we learned that our best customers are actually manufacturing companies, mm -hmm. which is amazing because this allows us to take advantage of this historical opportunity, which is the global supply decoupling and the rise of nearshoring. Because 62% of manufacturers have started their efforts to nearshore their productions closer to the US. It is expected that $5 trillion from manufacturing trade will shift into Latin America in the next five years. And we're here raising a 1.2 million pre-seed round to take advantage of this opportunity and get us to $4 million in ARR in the next 18 months. So who wants to benefit from this opportunity as well? Tell us about the product. Uh, where are you in the life cycle of it? Is it developed? Do you have customers? Like, where are you today? Yeah, so we have finance over 3,700 invoices today, over 150 companies. The product, it's completely developed. All our efforts had been put mainly on the automation of all the onboarding and on the writing process. So our users are, are able to access financing between four to six hours because we automated all this process. We don't require our users to upload their financial statements. Yep. 
because small and mid-sized businesses, it. they don't have them. Yeah, they outsource yeah. their accounting basically to just declare their taxes. We connect to multiple data sources. We get a clear view about which companies are actually credit worthy and also which receivables are credit worthy as well. Mm, mm. And what should have been your default rate to date? Default like write-offs that we have done, it's 0.5% today. The industries, hmm. it's 12% yeah, in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. That has been like our main focus, like yeah. being really disciplined on who we lend to because everybody wants money. Mm -hmm. We know that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. Yeah. yeah. The hard thing is to know who to lend to and how to collect. And yep. we nailed it. So why have you nailed it? You're saying, okay, we're taking this unstructured data. We're really sourcing it. We're looking at who owes the money, who is the company. But what else is going on there that's giving you that tremendous rate? Hmm. So... Something that I really love and was really hard to do is that our users, since they're manufacturing companies, they're not financing their utilities or their payroll. What they're financing, it's their cost of goods sold. So when we get the data, the hardest part was to tag every single transaction, every single invoice mm -hmm. that we scrapped. So we understand what's a cost of goods sold, what's an overhead mm -hmm. expense, what's a purchase of fixed assets. So we know their margins at every level. And then we have access to every single transaction that they have done over the last four years and we read it every single day. So mm. that's when we know like, okay, this is a, a good commercial relationship. So we're able to finance these receivables as well. So I don't know much about the Mexican manufacturing market. Yeah. In the US, right during the low interest rate years, one to three years ago, Amazing. some of the oldest companies were the revenue-based financing companies. Yeah. They're all struggling now in this interest rate environment. Can you talk a little bit about why you're different, why Mexico's different, why mm -hmm. your target customers are different? Totally. Um, so Mexico and Latin America have always suffered of really high interest rates. Yes. So, for example, our corporate business card charges 81% on interest rates. <laughs> yeah, that's just crazy. So today's what? high interest rates Is are nothing. still a bargain for us. Yeah. <laughs> like 8% in America, yeah. deal. When I was looking for financing, special, specifically factoring, at the last startup, I went out looking for the yeah. factoring companies and I saw companies charging 5% monthly. That's 60% yeah. an annual rate. Right. They ate all my margins. That didn't work. So right now we're mm. charging our users an, an average APR of 36%, which wow. is really good for them. Yeah. yeah. But we really still have good margins within that, with our cost of capital. Can you talk about that and any lines of credit you may have or whatnot? Yeah, so our cost of capital today is 15.97%. Our average APR, it's 36.14%. So there we have a 20% margin mm -hmm. spread. Mm -hmm. And we got here by raising an angel round of 137K. Because of that, we have always only been able to access a debt facility of a million bucks which has been our main constraint to be more aggressive on, on user mm -hmm. acquisition. Mm -hmm. So we're raising this round to help us unlock a $10 million debt facility that will allow us to get to those $4 million in ARR in the next months. So when you started, you were talking about just the default rate companies going under because they just can't get paid. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that the main driver of why they come to you or is it the rate? What's the pain we're solving here? So. Mainly is the access to financing. Yeah. Because banks in, in Mexico, they all require real estate as collateral oh, to provide any kind that. of business yep. loan. Yeah, forget it. These companies don't, don't have, have those it, assets. Yeah. Or the business owner will have to put their personal home, but in many cases, they're still paying them their mortgage, yeah. so they can't. The second one is the speediness, because mm -hmm. they are able to access this financing sometimes the same day or at most mm -hmm. one, two days after mm -hmm. they apply with us. And they need to know if they're going to have access to finance because they're commissioning large projects that they're going to get paid in mm -hmm. 90, 120, yeah. 180 days. So if they don't have the financing, they have to scale down, lose business. So that's where we come in and mm. help that main problem. Mm. Can you talk about collections? How do you collect? <laughs> we send automated uh, reminders, but the way we structure the, the legal component of the contracts, we incentivize our users to pay us first before any other liability. We track every single invoice on real time due to the electronic invoicing being mandatory in Mexico. So we know the status of every invoice on real time. 
So if they get paid by their customer and they don't pay us, that's considered fraud. So that's a criminal component oh. there. Oh. So because of that, they are incentivized yeah. Yeah, to pay yeah, us yeah. first Big before time. any other liability. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's not new that LATAM has very high interest rates. Um, kind of credit financing solutions are also not necessarily new. What is it that you guys have figured out that others that have come before you haven't necessarily? What we did is leverage technology to provide a better user experience and grant access to companies that were completely underserved. We want to take advantage of one industry in specific, mm -hmm. which is manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Focus on that customer, understand all their pain points, which we are doing because we want to go beyond the lending. Automate all their accounts receivables process, collections, consolidate mm -hmm. all the data in one place, which is Crefit, and input that into a cash flow forecast that our customers need, which is basically mm -hmm. on a weekly basis. They don't need it on a monthly basis. They need it on a weekly yeah. basis. Not yeah. When are they going to get paid? And that's how we start to add more value mm -hmm. and help these companies perform better financially. Can you talk a little bit about your background? Yeah, totally. Uh, and your team. <laughs> yeah. Also. Oh, yeah, the team is the best. Uh, <laughs> me, I'm a little bit more boring, but uh, <laughs> I used to be the CFO of another company. We became venture-backed with multiple cities across Mexico. And when we started to hit market fit with that company, mm -hmm. we started to sell to the ABM Bevs, to the Pepsis, mm -hmm. to the General Motors, to the Volkswagens. And that's when we suffered the problem of getting paid in net 180 days. I was the one in the rooms with the oh. accounts payable departments and the <laughs> financial uh, people of these Oof. companies. I was way too young. So the first time I got over leveraged there, but I learned a lot. And it was a masterclass in that sense. And I'm not a sole founder. So my co-founder, she's a senior software engineer of that other company because that company went under. Mm. We shut down. I had to fire the whole team. That was also my job. So, and she's also my sister. So the way I validated <laughs> the way I validated her skills here is because we went through two layoffs on that company, and the CTO always kept her. So I was like, okay, she's good. Okay, she, 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 that's the two founders, but we're at nine people today. We have our head of operations, we have a customer service department, and most of our resources have gone into the product team. So hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. can you just walk us through? Yeah. Numbers a little bit about burn runway mm -hmm. revenue oh, and yeah. all the good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> We're break even. Amazing. Nice. Congrats. We're break yeah. even. Congrats. We raised a small 137k. Um, Great. On runway, we have today well, well, infinite. Yeah. Infinite, mm -hmm. but yeah, we 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 expect to grow. Mm -hmm. Great. Where are you based? Mexico City. Uh, Guadalajara. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Where the nice. manufacturing? Is. That's the manufacturing, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I am always curious how people end up doing an idea. How did you end up doing, you know, factoring for manufacturing, let's call it. Do you have a manufacturing background? You kind of alluded to working with some of these companies, but... Yeah, so a lot of manufacturing companies are in Guadalajara. So at the beginning, the MVP wasn't as whole automated. Signatures were done in, yeah. in paper. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I spent a lot of the time with our customers in the early days of Gretvi, and that's when I started to learn about their whole pain points, their processes, their workflows, their customers. The way I landed in factoring is because I suffered this problem yeah. firsthand. Uh -huh. The worst was when I didn't have enough cash in the bank to pay the payroll. Mm -hmm. That kept me yeah. up at night oh, yeah. way too many times, to be honest. But yeah. I always paid on time. I, I made it work. So seeing the lack of a solution for this problem, that's what drive me to, to start this company. But the reason why I did the manufacturing is because we learned that we had the strongest retention rate, actual product market fit with this factoring and reverse factoring uh, product, and we understand the, the workflows. You've mentioned this other startup, but can you tell us what that other startup did? I'd love to hear like, what that <laughs> what startup <happened>? did. <laughs> yeah, so it basically was an influence marketing marketplace. So ah. we put together content creators in contact with big brands so that company didn't work out. What was the biggest learning you took away from the failure of that company? The pre-cred feed, post-mortem, is coming up after this. Welcome back. Luis is passionate about solving cash flow issues for manufacturing companies in Mexico. But the investors want to know what happened at the previous startup he worked for. 
to that company didn't work out. What was the biggest learning you took away from the failure of that company? You got to really like what you're doing and love the problem that you're attending. The founders of that company, I, I really admire them. I learned a lot from them, but they started because they like tech. Yep. It looked like it worked, got some traction, but they weren't really convinced about the problem that they were solving. They said, to, you know what, it's not worth it. Um, we're just gonna shut it. So that was one of it. The okay. second of it, the biggest learning that I got, is that you really have to put together a great team like really bring in a people to the game to to share the vision and uh i think those are the biggest takeaways that i take from that other experience i was there for six years so yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> those are good learnings so like, i'm gonna ask you a hard question startup. though yeah oh. you Please do. it sounds like you sort of stumbled a bit into this by talking with manufacturers yeah just given your background is not in any sort of manufacturing do you love the problem you're working on Cash flow, I do. I love it. I, I love that. That's why I'm working with this cash flow forecast to automate all the underwriting. At the end of the day, it's a finance problem. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I really do. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you had a GSS, so, um, yeah. as well. Yeah. What do you wish investors understood better about your business or the opportunity? Or what do investors not understand the way you understand it? That lending is still huge. The lack of access to financing, it's still a huge problem. I know that we're just factoring today, but the largest startup in Mexico today, it's just a purple credit card called Nubank. Yep. What are your terms? Yeah, we're raising 1.2. Yep. We already have 905K secured. From? Two VCs from Mexico, tech stars. Mm -hmm. We have also a VC from Singapore and some strategic angel investors. And what are the terms on yes. that? Oh, the yeah. terms, yes. Uh, sorry, the the last cap was signed at an 8 million post money cap. So we're out for simple reasons. We predominantly focus on the US and Canada. Now that said, I love what you're up to. You have an incredible energy as a founder. Seems like you've learned a lot and so I'm very bullish on that, but it's just not a fit for a fund, like the thesis and what we invest in. No worries, I yeah. appreciate it though. I am in for 50K. This is not typical to what I focus on, but I like the energy. I like the lessons you've learned. That's why I'm in. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. nice. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about the retention. 71% 24-month retention rate. What, what does that mean? Are you talking about dollars retained, number of customers number retained? Number of customers retained. Uh, net dollar revenue retention, 108. I love it when people actually know numbers. the numbers. Yeah. Now, I would hope that, given you're the finance yeah. person and you <laughs> love cash flow. You love totally. this man said, I love cash flow. I think I'm actually out. We were one of the first investors in ClearBank and went all the way up and then sadly all the way back down. And then we also have another company in our portfolio that you remind me of called Brightflow. Oh, yeah. So I think it's for us, we just have probably all of the exposure to kind of lending. But I will say this, like, I think this is a category that most investors don't understand. You can build really big businesses here. I have no question about that. I think we just probably have as much exposure at the firm level as we can take. But this seems like a really great idea and you seem like the right person to go after it. I really appreciate it, mm -hmm. Charles. So Hustle Fund has previously also had a credit fund. So we know a bit about debt, and I think my perspective is that lending companies have a hard time getting to scale as a VC-backed business because you don't want to obviously force bad loans, right? But mm -hmm. there's always sort of this pressure to grow. But obviously, you seem like you have a great cash management background just per your understanding of your numbers right off the bat. That's kind of where I'm struggling around like, okay, for lending in manufacturing in Mexico, like once you do all that slicing and dicing, and I know you have plans to try to expand in other ways in manufacturing, but still don't quite understand that vision. I feel like it's going to be challenging per the terms for us to get involved at the eight post. So thank you. No, thank you. So. <laughs> I love when it starts with so. <laughs> <laughs> you are really impressive. Appreciate it. 
this is a business that can be a really big business, but could be a hard business, right? I think you're focusing on the right market segment. Like manufacturing, nearshore manufacturing is going to be a gigantic deal. For a lot of the things that Charles and Elizabeth mentioned, tough. But I like you a lot. <laughs> I like you too. You were one of my <laughs> you were one of my first followers on Twitter when I started this entrepreneurial. Uh, thing. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for prudence' sake, I'm out. But. I feel like this is going to be one of those where I'm going to pop up one night and be like, I need Damn to give him a it. call. You're going to bug uh, me on text. But it, it's a note today. Ah, but but you're, you're incredible. And I do want to say one of the things that you mentioned that stood out to me is how much you spent late nights thinking about making payroll, but how you always made sure you paid on time. That's the same founder who's going to make sure That's that right. even if things go south, I get something back for my investors. Not mm -hmm. enough founders think that way, but... I could see you as somebody who's like, yeah, I'm not getting a zero out of this. You believed in me. And, and like that integrity that you had came through just from the stories you told about your previous company. I truly appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you, Louise. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's so nice to meet thank you. you. Thank you. It's great yes. to meet you. <clears throat> yeah, that's new. That I know, amazing. I love it. Because it's a good reminder for us that there are people outside <laughs> yeah. listening yeah. that are, are going to yeah. judge us afterwards. I, that experience is incredible. The way he talked about making sure things were getting done, it's impressive. The way he talked about making sure he talked to his customers and, and finding that manufacturing and the way you do factoring for manufacturing is different, but that's something that they can own. Mm -hmm. He's doing a lot of smart things. I was a little surprised that he only did 400K, right? Yeah, I thought yep. the valuation was frothy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think if the valuation mm -hmm. had been cut in half, I would have done it. Mm. Mm. Well, if it was cut in half. <laughs> well, yeah. no, but it's also but, LATAM. I mean, sure. let's just be honest. Geography matters because it matters on M&A. Yeah. It matters on how many people can fund you. Yeah. yeah. Like, the reason he hasn't raised that much, if we're going to be honest, is, like, there are just not that many investors who invest in LATAM. Yeah. I think at eight, now I have to believe this is going to be a billion-dollar business, and I think factoring and manufacturing in Mexico, like, that's, I, I don't think that's a billion dollar business. Yeah. He has to add on all these other pieces mm -hmm. to make it a billion dollar business. You have business. to believe in his ability to do the add on and yeah. navigate through those. Okay, we got this, we nailed this, here's the next four or five things, or here's the next four or five countries. Yeah, you have to believe in all of those things. But the thing Elizabeth said that's really true that I've seen a lot of these businesses is that, like, it's very, you should have incredibly low loss ratios in the beginning because you are sure. doing the prime loans like the very best highest quality lending and it's not just a pressure to grow it's entrant like we saw this when cap like when all the revenue based financing companies get like you can compete on two things like loan quality and price mm -hmm. yeah. both of which put pressure on your ability to scale the business either you have to compete over lower quality loans which will push your loss ratios up or to win the good ones you have to make less money and yeah, so yeah. it's really, and there really aren't any moats to lending other than having a lower cost of capital than your yeah. competition, which comes with scale sometimes. Mm -hmm. So are you saying this type of business actually gets less efficient at scale? No, it, it's just, you have no loyalty. People always want the best rate. Yep. So they're not necessarily incentivized to stick with you. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, we found this with our revenue-based financing fund, yeah. which I alluded to. So Hustle Fund had a revenue-based financing fund. But you don't it, anymore. We do not anymore. It did really well, but we had problems scaling it because other folks out there were willing to lend at way less profitable rates, and mm. we couldn't compete on that. I mean, same so we would lose deals, and that's what makes it hard to scale. Mm -hmm. uh, we made money, but I cannot imagine building that into a billion-dollar business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see the path to a mm -hmm. billion dollar business here? It's a little fuzzy for me, but I think he's the one to bet on if yeah. there was one. Yeah. If there was a like, who's going to be yeah. in LATAM, yeah. the billion dollar unicorn, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to bet on that. Okay. Well said. Thank you, guys. <gasps> Thank Another you. great pitch. Thank you. Yeah. Well done. Next Thank one. You. Five minutes. How we doing? Um, How we doing? Luis left the room with a $50,000 commitment from Beck. And the other investors did give him a lot of credit. After the break, we check in with Luis to see if Beck actually writes the check. 
or if this deal will end in default. Welcome back. Three months after his pitch, we called up Luis to see what happened with Beck. But first, were you happy with how your pitch went on the show? I was. I mean, when you look backwards and, and hear yourself, I, you always think like, okay, I could have answered this better. But I, I was happy. I was happy with the pitch and very happy to get to meet with these people that I really looked up to. So you got a $50,000 commitment in the room. Yeah. And then you had a due diligence call with Beck. Tell me what happened on that call. So I remember that we jumped into the call. I remember that she was in New York at the time wearing a four because it was super cold at that moment there. She told me that she had done a little bit of due diligence on her own. We talked about the competition. I do want to talk about the competitive landscape because you have some major, major players that have raised a lot of money. Spellin, for example, has raised $146 million. I'm like, hmm, okay. So walk me through, if you could, what's the difference here? The market has room for, for multiple competitors, but mm-hmm. most of them are trying to steal customers from the banks that are already being served. We have at least three to four users that churn from SEPI into credit mm. every month. Mm-hmm. And what mm-hmm. I've seen with SEPI is that they basically replicated their bank processes, which is mm. you get assigned an account executive, and that's a, a lot of backup for through WhatsApp that can take between six to eight weeks to, to get the financing. So that's basically where we're seeing subtle difference on the operational side. Yeah. But also, we're really focused on the manufacturing industry and I was certain that if you try to serve everybody, you end up serving nobody. Hmm. Um, hmm. Okay, I'm going to spend more time looking at the competitors. By the end of the call, like, where did things land? Like, how are you feeling? I didn't feel she left that call that convinced because she was pretty focused on the competition about this other competitor that has uh, raised a lot of money about a. Uh, a hundred million dollars uh, on equity. Then, then they also raised their debt facility. It's around one hundred and forty million dollars, which is a lot of money. We're working today with one million. So, yeah, yeah. There, there's a big difference there. So then, what happened after that call with Beck? So after the call, we got an email. I think it was a, a week later. Yeah, she basically said that she was impressed with what we had accomplished. But she used the other this analogy, like she liked the the jockey or, or the rider, but she didn't like the horse. The jockey, and, yeah, the jockey. But she she wasn't convinced about the horse, about mainly the market. I mean, the fact that there's this other competitor that has much more funding, so she's like a much oh, bigger horse, yeah, a much bigger horse. So she didn't see how we might win the market or win over this competitor. You should have responded and said, our horse is more agile. I should have said that. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I, mean, I, I still can. <laughs> you still can. It's not too late. Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, that's unfortunate. It's part of the game. I mean, I really like her. Uh, I like her vibe, her style. Too bad she didn't jump in. Is it frustrating to hear that as the reason for passing? It is. It actually is. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's something that I've, that I've heard a lot because, yeah, they have a lot of money, $140 million to, to originate loans. We only have one. Yeah. But the financing gap in Mexico in the, in the B2B market, it's $164 billion. So they, they can only serve 0.06% of the market. So... <laughs> it's not like all of us are banking in one single place. I mean, not in the States, not in Mexico. There are multiple banks that have their own expertise. Of the investors that passed, how many of them are identifying this competitor as their reason? I would say about half of them. Oh, wow. That's a lot. Yeah. And this is one of the answers where I dropped the ball or I didn't mention is that the way we leverage technology to provide the access to, to this financial product or services that this company needs is where we innovate. I mean, 
customers don't have to go to a bank directly to go get assignment an account executive and do a lot back and forth of documentation and the real estate as collateral. They need to provide their own property, mainly the house of the business owner. And you don't need any of that stuff. You just plug straight into their bank account and see the money flowing in and out. And you recognize the customers and you're able to put two and two together and say, all right, this is a good company to lend money to. Yeah. So can your competitor, this big competitor, can they even serve manufacturing companies? They could, but they would ask them for collateral. They would take around eight weeks to underwrite a customer. We take around six hours. This is the startup that's raised $100 million. That's right. <laughs> so the investors in the room who passed said they were not on board with the market. Like manufacturing companies in Mexico was too small for them. And they didn't see how you could turn that into a big, like billion dollar business. Do you hear that a lot from US VCs? I get that's like a, a first impression, maybe being from the States, you see other smaller countries like, yeah, I don't think that's going to be a, a big enough market, um, which it is. It, it totally is. Uh, today, there are 770,000 manufacturing companies just in Mexico. We only need 5,000 to, to get to $100 million in annual recurring revenue to be a billion-dollar company with the average revenue that we're generating today with our current users. 770,000 manufacturing companies? Yeah. Did you know that number in the pitch room? Yeah, I did. I, I, I did all my numbers beforehand in case I got that question. Okay, why didn't you say it in the pitch room? I, I didn't get the question. I only had... Two minutes to do the pitch. <laughs> and something that we, I like to point out, it's that in the tech industry, the BC, the startup world, everybody knows about our competitor because they raise this amount of money and they read crunch base and, and whatever. But our market done, doesn't do that. Our market's focus on something else. They're Wait, not- you're saying manufacturing companies in Mexico don't read TechCrunch? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We have our survey on our data room where we ask our customers, if CredFeed ceased to exist, what would be your other alternatives? Nobody mentions these other large startup. How's the rest of your round going? You had raised, I think, 905000 of your $1.2 million round on the show. Where are you at right now? The round is basically done. We're actually just missing, coincidentally, only 50 k <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh you're so close we are we actually got some tickets this week so we're we're there well there's one thing nobody ever doubted and that was the jockey <laughs> that's right gotta love that I do it, it, it was comforting to hear that <laughs> oh gosh So Lisa and I did a bit more digging on this deal. And while I respect the VCs on our show and their opinions, I think Luis is onto something big. People are seeing this as a lending company, but I actually think CredFeed is more like vertical software. Luis is using factoring as the Trojan horse to get people to use his software, automating the accounts and receivables for manufacturing companies. Does it sound sexy? No. But will it get manufacturing companies hooked on his product? Yes. This is one of those markets that sounds smaller than it really is. I believe Luis can build a massive software company, a software company that just happens to do a bit of factoring. So the pitch fund is investing 50,000 in CredFeed. If you're interested in investing with us, you can learn more at thepitch.fund. We just hit the halfway point for fund one, but we still have room for more listeners to join. If you invest now, you get ownership in all the companies we've invested in so far. It's a pretty good deal. Next week on The Pitch, finally, pants you can pee in. Pants were never designed to be worn by women in the first place. Until now. 
This is the GoFly technology. I might just be dense, but could you explain what this tech is? Is it the zipper? It appears like two different zippers, but this is actually one continuous zipper track that's sewn down between two poles. And then there's a custom fabric flap on the inside so that they're really comfortable, so comfortable that a third of our customers actually go commando. I have an investment in my portfolio that you remind me of uh, Sheertex. Mm-hmm. Oh, Sheertex is amazing. This innovation's dope. <laughs> You're dope. I have a problem, though. Answer nature's call next week on The Pitch. Subscribe now and turn on notifications so you don't miss it. This episode was made by me, Josh Muccio, Lisa Muccio, Anna Ladd, Enoch Kim, Jackie Papanair, and Alma Langshaw, with casting help from Peter Liu and John Alvarez. Music in this episode is by The Muse Maker, Breakmaster Cylinder, Strange Night, Cold Storage Percussion Unit, Boxwood Orchestra, and Fur Sticks. The pitch is made in partnership with the Vox Media Podcast Network. <laughs>